Hi everyone, it's great to have you all in the webinar on how is technology disrupting the e-commerce supply chain. I'm Pranshu, I head business at ClickPost and I would be moderating the session. Uh, before we begin, I just want to send the framework of how we'll conduct this webinar. Uh, we have with us four very senior e-commerce experts with us. Uh, I'll be asking them a series of questions around different areas in supply chain in e-commerce. The audience can also ask questions in the Q&A box below. Um, based on how much time we'll have, we have, we'll be able to pick up some of those questions right now. And for the remaining ones, we'll uh, try to provide you answers over email. Right? But you can uh, type everything in the Q&A box below. Uh, all right, uh, first things first, I just want to introduce the panelists here. Uh, we'll start in the alphabetical order. Uh, the first is Jackson. Jackson is the head of e-commerce at Puma. Uh, Puma did more than 1400 crore business in India last year ahead of all its competitors. Uh, next is Kalpak. Uh, Kalpak is co-founder of Shop 101, one of India's leading social commerce platforms where individuals can resell products. Then we have Pawan. Uh, Pawan is the chief supply chain officer at Tata Click and one of the pioneers of Omni Channel in India. And then we have Senthil. Senthil is head of products for post order experience and supply chain in Flipkart. He spent more than 10 years in Flipkart across different senior roles. So welcome all the panelists. It's great to have you here. Hi, hi everyone. Hi everyone. Thanks, Thanks for Hello. for the introduction. All right. Uh, I think we can get started. So uh, the entire conversation would be divided into three sections. We'll start with the demand and warehousing part. Then we'll move on to logistics and post purchase experience. And then finally, we are going to cover, cover returns, right? Uh, we'll start with the first part, which is <coughs> demand and warehousing. And my first question is for Kalpak. Uh, Kalpak, so everyone is talking about the next billion users, right? And uh, companies have seen more than 100% year on year increase in e-commerce user in tier three and tier four cities. So since you have a large customer base in these cities, uh, can you talk about how is the buying behavior of people evolving in these smaller cities and how does the e-commerce unit economics work out? Uh, sure, Pranshu. I think a very interesting question um, and specifically a trend that we are sort of seeing strongly. So I'll answer this question basis what we are seeing at Shop101. So um, as you spoke, uh, if you take the top 20 cities and actually uh, remove them, 70% of our sales actually comes from the cities outside top 20, which is a clear reflection of that. Uh, basically, uh, Bharat or tier three, tier four is actually moving online, right? Mm -hmm. uh, behind this, uh, we are basically seeing three key trends, uh, which is actually, which in our view is actually driving this, uh, this behavior. To start with, I think first and foremost is the, um, the internet penetration uh, in the country, right? I think uh, if you look at the numbers over the last two, two to three years, uh, in 2018, we had around 400 million uh, internet users, whereas right now that number is roughly around 700 to 800 million. That is just uh, doubled and predominantly the majority of growth has actually come from tier three, tier four and even beyond. Right. Um, and that's just not it. It's actually in addition to that, uh, what has also happened is the amount of time that the consumers are spending on internet is also doubled. Uh, or even more than that, right, in different segments. And uh, majority of this amount is actually spent on uh, social media as well as uh, other video platforms and uh, e-commerce uh, and other categories, right? Uh, so that's uh, one of the key trends that we are seeing, which is actually driving a shift in the uh, online to an offline space, uh, offline to an online space, sorry. Uh, second thing that uh, we are seeing and which we have interacted with consumers also as we speak to our uh, users, resellers, is that um, the range and the variety in tier three, tier four is actually very limited, right? If you look at the product specifically in categories like fashion, etc., uh, it's very difficult for a uh, end retailer to actually keep the, the variety that, in, uh, that, uh, that can be available online, right? And it's not, uh, and the consumers uh, in tier three, tier four actually aspire for that and actually want those products. Uh, which uh, is difficult otherwise. So, and uh, they're also ready to sort of spend uh, money to uh, to get as long as it's a value for money product. So that's a second trend which we are seeing in uh, buying behavior. 
lastly uh, i think uh, we uh, if you look at the country uh, right our uh, country is such where the taste changes every 50 kilometers it's fundamentally <coughs> a very diverse country where the taste and the usage patterns vary a lot where where is the shopman's run model actually fits in beautifully uh, in this case our reseller is actually able to curate the product the basis the need of the consumer basis the local demographics that the reseller is comes from or the buyer comes from right and he is able to share those products with the buyers uh, on uh, whatsapp facebook instagram and other social media channels like share chat and uh, make a sale right uh, in addition to this what uh, what also happens is that uh, in tier 3 tier 4 there is a very strong um, uh, trend towards going to the shop um, and saying bhaiya aur dikhao right uh, in terms of the material more and more uh, people go go are used to actually going to the shop and looking at different products so they they miss that that experience on a normal uh, e-commerce platform well, what resellers and what shop 101 we have been able to solve that is that reseller has been able to actually provide that experience it's uh, it's in, in case because reseller has been able to solve the questions push the products uh, to the buyers and uh, make the sale uh, which actually in one way if you look at it it's uh, it's like uh, you going to the shop versus the shop coming to you right and that uh, that sort of uh, driving the behavior of uh, purchase towards online um, i think that sort of the key areas on buying behavior secondly uh, i think you uh, the second question was around unit economics right yeah. um so uh, unit economics i think uh, all the other experts also here would sort of answer that has been a challenge for e-commerce uh, over the past few years or actually till now uh, <laughs> and i think there are three key drivers that i see behind uh, unit economics one is uh, just the type of categories that are being sold second is the customer acquisition cost and third uh, because of which we are talking here is the logistics which plays a very very crucial uh, role in uh, Uh, unit economics how we have been trying to solve the problem and actually have solved it partially is um, uh, is by um, sort of focusing on the categories which are unstructured categories long tail categories predominantly fashion uh, home decor uh, kids uh, uh, electronics uh, meaning the uh, post uh, the smaller value electronics items um, where uh, where the actually the price is not the differentiator where t- taste matters a lot curation matters a lot right and where the mm-hmm. price differential can be there which actually and the pricing can be such which actually leads to uh, unit economics and profitability um mm-hmm. secondly um, as i mentioned customer uh, acquisition cost for uh, traditional e-commerce has been a lot right if you can take it anywhere from the range of 500 rupees to 1000 rupees um for us uh, if you sort of look at that number uh, for the end buyer that's actually probably in the range of 120th uh, to 115th it's just because uh, our cost of customer acquisition itself is very low and one one reseller for us uh, actually gets around 6 uh, to 7 consumers which uh, makes the overall cost of acquisition very uh, low and the last uh, i think logistics um i think which we'll talk more in detail later but um, uh, uh, is one of the key drivers of uh, unit economics right it, it can swing the uh, needle either way and uh, we, uh, the key reasons there are rtos and returns right uh, how we are sort of trying to solve that is uh, because of because we have a person in between the reseller is actually able to uh, focus uh, more on del- getting the product delivered as well as also reducing the returns right it's very difficult to actually give a return to a person that you know right in general versus only giving it to a platform so those sort of things uh, are helping us in terms of solving the overall unit economics uh, problem all right understood karpa okay um, my next question is for jackson mm. jackson so for categories like apparel and shoes right where this touch and feel is important what are the online channels doing to replicate the offline experience of actually trying out the product yeah i think uh, so uh, this is a very important question for us especially because we have like close to 400 stores across the country right and uh, some of our consumers have already experienced uh, the superlative experience that they have at the store in terms of the product assortment and the selling so f- when we sell products online at least on a on a dot com platform it becomes so much more challenging uh, in terms of how do we communicate the right proposition so i'll probably want to break it down uh, into components um, and there are certain merits that we have or advantages that we have when we have selling when we are selling online versus offline and then there are certain uh, disadvantages which we are trying to solve with technology from from an advantage point of view um, we are super insistent in the kind of people we can get onto the platform right with the definite intent and with the right kind of messaging and once they are on the platform we get we have 
uh, probes across that we can get all kinds of signal on the consumer's journey when they are on the platform. So that way we are able to service the customer a lot better. But where we lack is uh, the whole touch and feel, the one-to-one -one connect that uh, you're talking about, right? And that's a very important question because uh, over time we have been used to buying that. And now we're wow. seeing that over years that the phenomenon like buying online is becoming more mainstream, right? Uh, there are impediments to it that we are trying to solve. And let's think through what are the, what are the roadblocks or what are the things that we need to iron out. Um, also, another important thing is from, a, from an overall assortment and offering point of view. Uh, in online, like in a store, there's only limited inventory that you can store, uh, show, right? But when it comes to online, we have probably the entire warehouse and whatever is there in the network, we can showcase to the consumer. So that's a big plus. But when it actually comes to the product selling or the concept selling, huh? somebody, uh, so that's where we want to solve. So I think very important is to have the right kind of content. Huh? People are going to consume content. They want to know what kind of product, what's the usability of the product, right? So that content has to be like very, very user focused. I think imagery plays a, a very important part. And is what we've seen is is videos have helped a lot. And now increasingly across platforms, you see the use of videos uh, to show how the product can be styled, how it has been used, uh, et cetera, and stuff. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, in online, what we can do also is around recommendation, recommendation about recommending the right kind of product based on uh, the use case of the person, uh, which I think we can do a lot better online because it's scalable. It's it's actually not dependent upon the store staff in a particular location and his or her knowledge of how the selling happens. But now it's all al algorithmically driven, uh, right? And so we can make the right kind of re recommendation or almost the right kind of recommendation day in, day out at every instance, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, those recommendations along with the styling element, what we've also seen, it's, it's just not the product, but how the product, the footwear goes with the apparel, with the top, etc. I think that kind of inspiration can be done a lot more better in the online front. Like while we lose out on the touch and feel, and I think that's a very difficult problem to solve, but the mm -hmm. other problems that, uh, or the enhancements that we are bringing to the solve, I think is, is getting us closer to that experience, right? Also other innovative stuff that uh, we're thinking of, it's, it's in the road, uh, roadmap and many of the sites already have is probably having like a live chat. If somebody is really keen on talking to a person, uh, of course, there is chat around, you can chat with them. They're also thinking about video chat. If somebody really wants to see a person and then chat to get the, like the human to human connect, uh, right? So that becomes a very powerful tool, all right? Uh, mm -hmm. other, uh, other stuff like augmented reality to see how the, the product fits in your foot or how it, how, how it feels when, or how it looks when you're wearing it, uh, magic mirrors, all those kind of stuff, no? Those augmented reality stuff are other enhancements, but they are more like a deep tech kind of stuff that can be done. But I think some of the basic things that uh, can be done is around the right imagery, content, sizing guides, right? Uh, they will go a long way in solving the problem. And also, I think one very important thing that many times uh, uh, we, we fail to see is the whole customer data. Like if the consumer has bought from us once, right? Uh, we have, if you have gathered enough data about the customer, the next time we just have to make the right recommendation. Because sometimes yeah. in fashion apparel, based on the, uh, the cast or the, the way the product is molded, sometimes the fitments can change. So I think it then becomes very important for us to intelligibly uh, make the right recommendation for that product. Right. So, so while to your question of, of course, there is a, a touch and feel how the material does that, that element is missing, but there are a lot of other enhancements across the chain that we can do to actually elevate the whole buying experience online. And that's, that's where we are working, to, working towards one step at a time. And, and we've seen the results over time. All right. So Jackson, these uh, videos and um, augmented reality sort of things that you talked about, do you think that in these categories, you've seen a clear decline in returns in cases where you've put up a video instead of an image or allowed customer to actually see how it look? Yeah. So uh, I think... Uh, um, the returns, I think the biggest problem around returns, whatever, uh, uh, there are multiple factors and uh, we can probably go deeper into that if you want. But the big, there are uh, the biggest re reason for returns, especially RMA, which is somebody opened the box and said, oh, this doesn't work for me, is the fitment, right? 
uh, and something like an augmented reality cannot probably solve that problem it can be done only with the right sizing guides and if it's an existing user and you have enough data about the user then you making the right recommendation on size and fit right uh, yeah. also there are other tools that uh, if you have your body contours etc it can help you get the fitment we are actually exploring some of these solutions yeah of course then uh, some of these deep tech really help on that front also but i think the uh, the low hanging fruit is about the right uh, measurements and the content and then we can right. go up the notch there understood all right uh, my next question is for senthil so senthil we have taken two questions from the e-commerce side now one for the, from the logistics end as well um, so prediction of estimated delivery date is critical to drive conversions on the site right and it also helps in reducing customer queries so uh, during these times when the there are so many variables in place have you introduced new factors to uh, you know sort of estimate this delivery date in a better fashion any changes in algorithm that you've made Uh, so, like uh, Pranjal, you mentioned, right? Uh, the delivery time estimation is important for two factors. One is buy time affirmation, which is uh, leading to confirmation conversion improvement by providing a better uh, better uh, delivery time to customer. Secondly, it is also under during the execution of the order, the delivery time becomes more important in terms of uh, keeping the customer intact in in, in managing his anxiety. Uh, and uh, if there's any disruption, giving a uh, early information to him. So. So all that is important. Right? So uh, from our side, we'll be looking. So sorry, sorry, I can't hear you clearly. Can you slightly move towards Simon? Yeah. Ah, uh, sorry. Is this better, Prashant? Sorry about that. Yes, this is better. Thanks. So I was talking about uh, delivery date. Delivery date is an uh, important factor for both from the buying uh, decision making perspective, which is leading to conversion, and secondly from the order and uh, order delivery process where uh, certain elements, uh, certain cases where customer will have a high level of anxiety. in terms of when to, when to get an order and all those things thirdly from a supply chain perspective there are possible disruption that can happen which can be unpredictable right? so by uh, giving a, a yearly a delivery delay communication to customers also important right? so this is how the importance of the delivery uh, timeline looks like but now from algorithm perspective what we did is if you look into the major part of moving your inventory from all the way from the warehouse to the customer the majority of the time it is going to spend is in transport Right, which is uh, uh, so. I am breaking down these two into two processes. One is control process, and one uh, uh, one is exposed processes. Transport form into the exposed processes. Right, right. Transport contributes to roughly seventy percent of the uh, time of the delivery. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, transport since it is uh, it is an exposed process, uh, uh, predicting the uh, transport time comes from two areas for us. One is uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, mining the data and looking at how, how what is the time day and time duration. it takes for a product to move from one node to another node and then all right uh, and secondly uh, the real time feeds uh, which can, which which is possible disruption that can uh, introduce in the supply chain like for example it could be all the way from a climate change to to something like, like a bridge is broken down and the and the traffic is piling up those kind of uh, interactions also important for us to do so uh, from the e-commerce side what we have done uh, so far is uh, Uh, one is uh, having a prediction mechanism in terms of transport transit times right while all other processes are being controlled and it is uh, well designed and monitored and it is kind of standard we see the disruption happening on the more on the transport side uh, for that uh, uh, we have prediction algorithms in place and secondly uh, real time information feed uh, mining all the way from the climate data to get, getting in, inputs from various channels uh, about uh, uh, the disruption possible is also taken as a second input in order to provide a supply uh, to uh, to provide the uh, estimated time to customer uh, thirdly comes the real uh, last mile uh, part uh, mm-hmm. last mile part is uh, it contributes to the uh, 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 roughly 10 to 15% of your delivery time times in the last mile part it is more about when will i get the delivery in the delivery time in the hands of the customer it is more come it, it uh, last mile is more about the time on a day uh, prediction compared to all other problem statement that i mentioned which is more about uh, delivery date prediction right? from the last mile perspective we have uh, we we have understood we have done geo intelligence understanding geo clusters and thereby we know how to route the product so uh, yeah, uh, having sophisticated routing algorithms has enabled us to predict uh, how uh, what is the time window where the delivery will be done and uh, accordingly be able to communicate that to customer right so both the things have uh, been the evolution that we are in the uh, we are making and we are seeing good success all right understood 
Santhil, in terms of ground data that you were talking about, any disruption that actually happens on the ground, how do you get this data? Is there a person who is actually sending out this data or are you mining it through internet? So we mine through both the channels. Uh, internet channel is, uh, is, is started and used for climate purpose. We also have uh, Twitter feeds, uh, which we use uh, to see, uh, to notice the disruption. But however, the manual information, because all the executives and, and, uh, and uh, uh, delivery personnel are on the ground, they are the first person to get this information and creating a channel for them to access this information to all the way to the uh, decision-making system uh, is another uh, invention that we have done. All right, understood. Okay, uh, thanks, Andrew, for that. Uh, so, from demand, we'll slightly move towards the fulfillment now. And my first question is for Pavan. Uh, Pavan, so many companies are trying to use their offline stores as fulfillment centers, right? Uh, since you are head of supply chain at uh, Tata Unistore, just want to understand from your perspective, how does this uh, fulfillment from offline stores? How does this impact the warehousing strategies? And what are the challenges that you face in this? So, uh, hi everyone to start with. And I think, see, uh, if you look at uh, warehouses of retailers, and here we are applying the perspective of a retailer over here, uh, warehouses of uh, retailers typically are attuned to B2B uh, shipments wherein they do the uh, replenishment for their stores. Mm -hmm. Other than that, most of the retailers have also started the B2C shipments and uh, the inventory is earmarked for uh, e-commerce operation per se. But if the customer if the value proposition to the end customer is is fresh merchandise, then I think uh, stores have to be the rise and the for uh, a retailer to be able to showcase the entire range. So I think if both warehouses and stores, if they are used in in concurrent with each other, they complement each other because stores, if you were to look at it, it will give the access to the customer from a range standpoint, whereas warehouses will give you the depth. So both have their own role to play. Of course, when uh, one starts exposing inventory to stores, there are a couple of other advantages as well. A retailer, for example, if you look at it, is inter-store inter mobility of the stock is a bigger concern for the retailer. And as one of my colleagues pointed out that uh, rather than if, if one is able to expose the inventory across stores, then a customer sitting in a, for example, if I were to give a Mumbai example, a customer sitting in a place like South Mumbai, will also be able to access the inventory which is lying in a store which is in Navi Mumbai for that matter of fact. So real-time access to the entire range is possible by virtue of the fact that you expose inventory. Uh, but at the same time, there are uh, other, 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 other advantage also is from a unit economic standpoint, which some of my friends pointed out over here is, can we bring inventory closer to the customer? So if, if your order management system or the allocation logic is such that uh, basis the destination pin code of the customer, if you're able to allocate the order to the nearest possible store, then of course you are able to save the cost from a first mile and a line haul cost as well, wherein you could directly move the product from the, uh, from the store to the customer location. So therefore the cost also becomes a very important kind of a factor if you start exposing the inventory of the store. And uh, the TAT will also play a very critical role because uh, at least you could attempt a next day delivery if not the same day delivery. So, so these are the two sorts of advantages with stores. But uh, as you start exposing inventory across stores, there are a lot of challenges which one encounters when one starts exposing store inventory. So first, first and foremost is, you know, stores are not meant to do back-end operation. So mm -hmm. stores are meant to forward, uh, do forward selling. And therefore, they're the first and the fundamental challenge which a retailer forces is with regards to building the capability within the stores so far as this pick pack ship operation is concerned. And therefore, so long as the size of the store is smaller, it warrants. Uh, it does not warrant dedicating uh, dedicated staff for the for managing the pick pack operation. But ultimately, if the store is a large size store, which is more than five thousand to ten thousand square feet, wherein the store itself is a departmental kind of a store, and 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 there are multifarious categories, it makes all the more sense to have a dedicated staff uh, uh, towards managing the pick pack ship operation. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have to look at it, it's from a cost standpoint, uh, the cost of processing an order in a store is far higher as compared to the cost of uh, the order getting processed in a warehouse because the real estate cost and the opportunity cost which the store colleague will lose out with regards to managing this pick pack operation, pick, pick, pick pack ship operation is considerably higher. So I think that's one piece. Second aspect is, as I said, you know, with regards to the capacity of the store. So typically, if you have to look at it, there is a particular, per, particular SQ which most of the customers are buying, uh, you'll find that uh, the 
during uh, end of season sales there is a spike in orders across the stores so so therefore it is extremely important that one should not start with one or two stores but one should try to expose the inventory across stores so that one is able to throttle the uh, orders uh, based on the processing capacity of that particular store i think that's that's the second challenge and the underlying thought process over here is that you expose as many number of stores as possible so that you are able to throttle the uh, order uh, volume across stores based on their processing capability and processing capacity second as third aspect is when when you start exposing the inventory across stores typically retailers have this uh, have this tendency to expose the inventory across multiple marketplaces so by virtue of the fact that most of the stores carry the ratio packs most of the fashion retailers for that matter of fact so therefore the depth becomes a bigger kind of a challenge over here and therefore the rejects at these stores are pretty high if the because because you don't run deeper so far as the particular sq is concerned and therefore real time inventory sinks become a very critical factor over here so of course i mean the it infrastructure takes time to uh, time to evolve and most of the retailers sink up their pause with regards to their uh, inventory management systems almost i mean not at a frequency of 3 or 4 hours but at a frequency of 12 hours so in this kind of a context one uh, one sort of a solution is that one has to arrive at a safety stock and expose the inventory with a safety stock in mind when the inventory is getting exposed to uh, uh, exposed to uh, online sales fourth aspect is with regards to the returns now i mean so if you were to look at it is the uh, uh, non delivery returns uh, which whether it's a prepaid return or a cod return or whether it's a uh, it's a return which is a customer initiated return so mm -hmm. typically if a retailer is uh, is using a marketplace kind of a model to expose the inventory then of course the product moves back to the origin and if you were to look at it is coordinating across a multiplicity of stores from a return standpoints becomes a very uh, very challenging kind of an affair standardization of qc processes across uh, stores becomes a challenging kind of an affair and therefore it's extremely important that you need to have your it systems and systems and processes geared up to ensure that at least the return shipments move to a centralized location and the centralized location can be a warehouse in this context because with the advent of gst now the interstate mobility in any case does not attract a cst or a interstate mobility tax so i think uh, that is something which has to be thought through last but not the least uh, is the systems so a store manager or the store staff when he or she is processing the order he has to toggle across multiple systems for order processing for inventory depletion and for billing in his system as well so far as the inventory depletion is concerned so i think that's the other challenge which uh, typically uh, store colleagues a uh, struggle with and i think uh, availability of a single point interface so far as processing of the orders and inventory depletion will become a critical factor as 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 brands or as retailers start exposing inventory across multiple marketplaces because typically if you start exposing inventory across multiple marketplaces then the store colleague has to go to their urls open their system process orders across them and then once again come back to pause for uh, their own store billing so i think these are the sort of challenges but the advantages which we have foreseen by virtue of the fact that uh, retailers have started exposing inventory uh, from the stores is that almost 60 to 70% of the orders typically come through come through stores only and uh, lastly the pricing factor has to be in control because if you were to look at it is uh, warehouse inventory in any case is minus 2 minus 3 inventory so there is less of pricing control but when when store inventory starts getting exposed Uh, retailer would like to exercise the pricing control as well so i think uh, pricing control also will play a very critical role so as to provide the seamless uh, customer experience uh, of having shopped that particular product online as well as offline okay understood yeah mm, thanks pawan for that i think uh, that takes it takes us to the end of the first session and we have a small poll for the audience i'll just open it up so uh, audience you can probably see a poll in front of you you can start to answer these and so the question is what leads to the highest number of customer queries is it delay in dispatching goods or b fake delivery attempts or c actual delivery delay beyond the commitment date and the lack of tracking updates we we'll just see what the audience has to say
All right. Uh, I'll end the poll in ten seconds. All right. Uh, I'll share the results. So, uh, according to the audience, the lack of tracking updates is the biggest reason that leads to highest number of customer queries, and this is closely followed by the fact that by the second option, which is actual delivery date beyond the committed date, these seem to be the biggest drivers. That's what the e-commerce experts in the audience think. All right. Uh, so now we'll be moving on to the next section, which is logistics and post-purchase customer experience. Before that, I would just want to take one minute to talk about the organizers of the webinar. It's Incref, Ecart, and Clickpost. Clickpost is India's largest logistics intelligence platform, helping companies like Shop One One, Puma, Nike, Farmeasy, etc., to reduce RTOs and improve customer experience. Ecart is the supply chain arm of Flipkart Group. It's among the largest e-commerce networks in the country. catering to multiple brands with a wide array of supply chain solutions um, besides flipkart and incref incref enables fashion brands to improve sales velocity through smart merchandising and by exposing 100% inventory across offline as well as online sales channel so thanks so much for to the organizing companies all right uh, we'll start with the next section which is on logistics and post purchase customer experience and my first question is to kalpak uh, kalpak just to set the context in this uh, of this section right I just want to understand what are the top two areas of logistics where technology seems to be adding the greatest value for e-commerce companies yeah. um so if you uh, talk about technology i think technology is probably the backbone of the current logistics right i think it is because of technology that we have been talking about uh, all the deliveries and uh, what sentinel and pawan just sort of spoke about um so yeah the current uh, and if you actually think about the the model that uh, we are sort of building shop 101 at shop 101 is um, the reselling model where uh, uh, a reseller actually can sell from anywhere in the country to um, a buyer anywhere in the country from a supplier which is actually anywhere in the country it's uh, only possible because of the uh, the technological advancements on logistics and operations of actually being able to manage the uh, real time inventory uh, across uh, across multiple suppliers right i think uh, uh, pawan also just spoke about that uh, inventory management is the most critical angle uh, where uh, if an inventory is actually lying in surat the same reseller is actually uh, multiple so uh, hundreds and thousands of resellers are actually able to leverage the same inventory to be able to sell it through uh, to the different buyers and uh, that's a that is possible only because of technology so i think that's sort of the first angle um apart from that i think second very very uh, clear area that i think uh, uh, is uh, technology in what we are leveraging currently is the uh, selection between the different shipping partners right i think that we also just said that at clickpost so along with clickpost also and in line with that we are also developing something internally is that uh, uh the, it's absolutely critical to actually allocate the right order to the right shipping partner right because of uh, multiple reasons one is just uh, the experience that you are actually delivering it to your uh, end user consumer buyer uh, and second is actually the cost that is associated with it so um the uh, sort of uh, technology is playing a role where uh, we're building um different uh, at an order level what uh, 3pl should be selected faces the difference performance uh, at lane levels as well as also uh, the cost that is associated with it so looking at even second degree uh, um, signals uh, looking at second degree signals like first time strike rate and uh, multiple lane choking and uh, different things which is actually uh, leading to the right selection of 3pls which is helping us improve our uh, tats on delivery as well as also uh, actually reduce the cost on shipping um and probably last uh, i think where technology is playing a role which is just a broader overall technology where i think the 3pls are also helping us is actually shift uh, from uh, and uh, cod to an online behavior right all of us know that cod is a very major challenge uh, in this industry and uh, overall i think thanks to covid um, the we have seen a very very strong shift in online uh, payment across uh, across the board across different uh, states uh and um, uh, so one is that we are trying to push it internally and actually push it through technology to drive higher adoptions um secondly what you're also seeing is that uh, logistics players are actually giving the service or giving the facility to be able to actually make a uh, payment online at the time of delivery so it's converting an existing cod order to actually an online order even post purchase 
So I think those are the key areas where I, I see technology playing a very strong role uh, in logistics. All right, understood. Um, Senthil, a similar question for you. Uh, so from the logistics provider's perspective, right? A uh, lot of first time buyers are being added to the system right now. What can technology and product do to improve their first time experience, right? And if you can talk about the top two biggest things that as a tech provider you can do. The, the focus here branch is more about uh, building trust and convenience to the first time buyers because uh, their first transaction should be memorable so that they will be a repeated customer, right? In that angle, uh, if, uh, there are two uh, two axes that we taken. One is uh, from the trust building expect uh, uh, trust building ex uh, 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 format. In that, uh, I, I think uh, Kalpak also talked about the COD providing multiple digital payments op option because cash is one of the option that is getting uh, less traction from the customer uh, as we as we evolve. So we uh, we offer more digital transactions and digital uh, formats of payments even at the doorstep. That's one thing that we are doing. Secondly, is uh, at, the, at this current uh, scheme of things, uh, safety has become a, one of one of the top of the mind uh, uh, problem statement, uh, both from the business as well as from the customer perspective. So, consistent communication about the safety of who is delivering and ensuring that the uh, the delivery pers personnel has uh, gone through all the norms that is required to ensure safety. Right? Uh, and uh, that also follows by communication. Communication not only on the safety aspect but also by uh, giving repeated updates about delivery and if there's any delivery uh, delay that is going to happen and we want to give a four, uh, uh, three information to the customer about the uh, about uh, this thing, right? so these are some of the things that we are uh, regularly improving from a more uh, um, uh, different perspective what we are thinking of is uh, solving for uh, new services as well as uh, returns as an important aspect for the first time buyers right uh, so uh, new services include uh, so i think uh, Jackson and Kalpak also talked about it a little bit on the on how can we create uh, uh, yeah, experience through through uh, through the online channel. So to 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 do that, we have uh, introduced something called open box delivery and uh, and uh, solutions around uh, uh, return pickups where we do small uh, item based uh, verification at the doorstep. So these are some of the things that uh, that has been uh, uh, solved in the recent times uh, for the first time buyers. Okay, understood. Uh, okay, uh, taking this ahead, another question for you. So, uh, Shop 101, I think I've seen more than 90 lakh registered users on your platform since 2015, right? These are resellers, most of them. And they are from tier 3 and 4 cities. Can you talk about the unique challenges in post purchase journey that you face in that particular segment? Sure. Um... Yeah, I think post purchase is um, as uh, as critical as actually the pre pre purchase journey of different resellers. Yes, and I think uh, we've sort of seen a very strong traction from tier three, tier, uh, tier four, as I've sort of spoken earlier, uh, and actually gives us the uh, uh, feeling that this will actually become big. Um, the uh, the couple of key challenges that uh, I think are there uh, specifically from the logistics side and also which impacts unit economics is the the entire um, uh, RTO piece or which we call it the un, uh, unopened uh, returns, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is I think that's sort of one of the most important issue and also the challenge that the resellers also face. So I'll, um, I think um, that how we are sort of solving with technology is uh, we're sort of building um, RTO model as well as also an address model uh, based on machine learning. Here, what we are trying to do is actually gather all the uh, information or the data points that we have uh, with respect to a certain uh, order, uh, which is basically the the history of the reseller, the 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 category in which that order is, the basically the pin code uh, from which it is picked to the pin code that it is delivered, the 3PL that being selected, and um, multiple other uh, data points, which actually gives us the predictability of RTO. Uh, at the time of the or when the order is placed. Uh, in uh, in addition to that, what we also do is actually with all the historical uh, addresses as well as also the address uh, basis uh, uh, public information, we actually have developed a model which actually predicts the um, accuracy of the address at the time of placing the order. So once we actually get this um, uh, probability, what we do is we actually um, uh, surface the the orders where the probability is bad and where the chances of delivery is very low to the resellers to actually be able to confirm the order and actually put the right uh, address or actually the phone number or the pin code, um, one of uh, those things, right, which actually leads to a uh, improvement in the uh, overall delivery. 
i think that's one of the key areas that we are focusing on in terms of improving the post order uh, delivery experience for the reseller as well as also impacting the cost on um, for our side um secondly um i think um, one of the key things uh, is um, in the entire post order journey is this entire vernacular piece right where as you move down to tier 3 tier 4 uh, vernacular plays a very very strong role the penetration of english is actually significantly less so um, the one way uh, in which we sort of uh, solve it is uh, is actually getting the reseller in between right uh, which actually helps us uh, solve the problem for the buyers because reseller is able to understand the language um mm-hmm. apart from that what we've also done is actually we've created the app in eight languages uh, uh, at least the basic sort of functionalities which are there which helps the resellers uh, being able to transact uh, onto the platform uh, in a, a vernacular manner uh, post that what we are also trying to build is actually um, the capability to um, uh, get the entire post order journey in vernacular which is basically say starting from sending the sms about the orders uh, a different tracking uh, tracking that happens about the orders as well as also any uh, customer segments um, customer uh, calls so i think customer calls are still sort of already covered but other areas is uh, i think uh, on the vernacular side is that we're trying to uh, develop um, yeah i think these are the two uh, most critical post order uh, pieces that uh, sort of we are seeing the, the where the challenges are there we are sort of also focusing on that in this also i think there another angle that comes is is the entire uh, non delivery report or uh, basically the the failed attempt or the failed deliveries right where uh, as you go deeper into the heartlands of the country uh, the challenges of uh, failed delivery increases i'm sure central and everyone else also is completely aware about that right so um, i think that is an area of focus for us where we are trying to solve for uh, the information flow as se- seamless as possible uh, between the 3 pl to the um, uh, to the reseller to the buyer actually in a smooth fashion so that uh, the the attempt can be made the the subsequent ap- attempts about delivery actually can be made strongly uh, either through a whatsapp communication or through an ivr communication or an sms communication so uh, i think those are the post order um, things that uh, are critical and uh, which we are working on yep makes sense i think both the points about vernacular having vernacular uh, things in place so doing that language localization to make sure that local customers are able to understand those tracking messages this is something which is very critical and also the point on uh, managing failed deliveries and automating the process i think that plays a very critical point in driving your logistics costs absolutely all right so uh, before my next question uh, i'd like to share a quick uh, stat that was done by adobe on us customers uh, so it was observed that in april the number of orders which were placed online and picked up at st- stores those increased by 208% for the us consumers right so while a lot of it might be due to the covid impact uh, i think click and collect model is something which might increase in india as well so i just want to take opinion on of pavan uh, pavan what do you think about the click and collect model and do you think it's scalable in india Uh, so i think so far as click and collect is concerned and as you uh, cited the example of uh, us i think uh, there this retailer called john lewis in uk in mm-hmm. case of john lewis uh, the click and collect contribution is to the extent of 35% of their overall sales so i think that's high as it goes in those that part, part of the world but uh, click and collect if you to look at it you know i would like to divide this uh, problem statement into two types one is the see it is trying to solve the problem of speed as well as it is trying to solve the problem of convenience as well and speed on convenience can be achieved both put together provided the fact that if the product which is which the customer wants to buy is within the vicinity uh, is available within the store which is in his vicinity or within his catchment i think then click and collect becomes a very killer kind of a proposition saying that you know i could go and collect the product within 2 hours from the store uh, near my particular uh, uh, in my catchment second aspect is the power of click and collect is also as my friend spoke to uh, uh, spoke about the fact that the uh, high cost of returns which is rto or cir for that matter of fact the customer can choose to go to the store open the packet and if he is not satisfied with the product he can return the product then in there itself and typically most of the retailers uh, i mean have the uh, i mean at least in our case we have the choice of either the customer getting the retailer credit note so that the sale is retained there is no reversal of sale at the retailer end and he gets a credit note which is nothing but a currency which he can trade off uh, for a period of about 6 months validity so i think that becomes a very good kind of a proposition wherein you are able to uh, reduce the number of returns 
but but that, that but that's a very sweet spot which is very difficult to achieve as i spoke to you about the fact that the ratio packs and the depth running low uh, uh, in in stores so therefore typically if you if it is within the retailer ecosystem it is a parent to feeder which works to a great extent so parent to feeder what i mean to say is that you know inventory could move from a warehouse to a store and the customer can collect it from the store or inventory could move from a store to store and the customer can choose to collect it from the store i think uh, in both these kind of a proposition wherein the click and collect is within the ecosystem of the retailer the post purchase experience uh, can really be controlled i think and and one has a, has a great handle over the post purchase experience because the same store staff standardization of uh, interaction with the customer standardization of the used cases and the response to the used cases can easily be done but there is a third extension which in any case as you rightly said will for, and and most of the even logistics players are trying to uh, 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 trying to uh, what i should say experiment in india most of the marketplaces are also wanting to experiment in india when you have a third party agnostic uh, or i should say brand agnostic kind of a store like a kirana store where you could go and pick up the stuff so i think that's also a, a third kind of a proposition or a rendition to a click and collect wherein you could save a lot of cost in the last mile because uh, the last mile cost to the extent of 30 to 40% can be saved if the customer can be prompted to come to a particular location to come and pick up the stuff and and similar renditions or extensions of this can be the locker system or uh, in countries like spain wherein wherein uh, every housing society has a drop box wherein the uh, wherein the delivery colleague can go and uh, drop the shipment in that drop box so i think that these are the sort of solutions which will definitely come in because uh, last mile delivery cost is is a significant cost uh, not because of the fact that uh, from a absolute standpoint it is high but if you were to look at it the effective cost the cost of ndr or the non delivery return and the cost uh, and the cost associated with cod is extremely high second aspect is one thing which needs to be borne in mind when one tries to adopt a click and collect model is that what would be the window of opportunity that you would give to the customer to come and collect the stuff because typically if you go to uk and us kind of geography the customer is given the choice of uh, or or the time window of around 3 uh, to 4 days or at max 7 days so i think this 3 to 4 to 7 days is is a kind of a time window which a retailer has to trade off with regards to the fact that you have been deprived of not being able to sell the inventory to some other customer because you have blocked this inventory for a particular customer second aspect is during our studies when we were trying to study we realized that the take rate on cod shipments is 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 more or less the same as to what happens in a front ending online kind of a delivery where the take rate is uh, is to the tune of 63 to 64 percent but if, if but if it's a prepaid shipment then the take rate has goes as high as 99.5 to 99 percent so i think i think restricting uh, uh, click and collect to a prepaid will definitely be able to uh, immediately show the results uh, 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 results to a retailer as well as to a logistic service provider okay understood all right thanks for for that uh, we'll pick up pick up an audience question now uh, so uh, jackson this question for, is for you uh, what is the percentage of growth that you are expecting from e-commerce this year compared to last year and what percentage of the overall business do you think uh, is going to come from online unmute myself yeah so uh... so post the lockdown actually what we've seen is a uh, uh, actually i was discussing with some of the colleagues here in the panel that we've seen strong growth in online uh, at there's days in which we see close to 2x of the uh, sale that we have done from the past uh, the same time last year so i think there is a there is tremendous momentum that we are seeing in the online front uh, but that is uh, but the the challenge on that side is logistics and fulfillment right Uh, from an overall perspective i think we will continue to see the momentum uh, for the rest of the year but our biggest challenge still remains warehousing and how to get the products delivered from an overall uh, perspective i think puma for us uh, like 50% close to 50% of our business was already online so i think this number to keep growing and we will probably uh, have uh, more de- digital avenues of actually reaching out to customers in some of the uh, some of the solutions that we've already discussed uh, some of the other panelists discussed huh, from uh, how do we get our store inventory live and more active uh, and get cus- consumers in the locality to actually buy from a uh, from a from a neighborhood stores so all these uh, 
mechanism oh. once into play i think the 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 digital uh, medium of actually discovering puma products and get getting the products delivered will overall increase so i personally i see the momentum up north all right understood okay uh, thanks everyone this uh, ends our second section and we'll move towards the third section which is on returns we won't be able to cover all the questions because we only have 8 minutes left but uh, yeah we'll try to cover as much as possible and my first question is again for jackson uh, jackson so this is around returns right uh, many companies have seen the cost of processing returns increase by about 25% during these times because of all all these steps they have to take to ensure that it's properly sanitized uh i know you have covered a lot around how to minimize returns earlier as well but any other point you want to add how do on how to business uh, how can businesses minimize these returns right and how does it impact the overall economics right i think uh, for our segment no returns is a, like a a very very big channel a challenge yeah? because uh, upwards of 30% returns uh and with a comp- uh, and you compounded by the fact that we have like a 30 day return window so a product that goes out it might be like two months by the time the product comes back uh, and then we have problems of uh, getting it back on the shelf we will probably lose a season in the process uh, and overall it has a big cost impact on my logistics and my opportunity to sell now we are already living in that uh, complex world in our category on top of that with the the current situation uh, where we have to now take extra care uh, of all the returns that come in uh, like quarantine the product and there is a certain protocol that we need to follow etc at the warehouse and stuff now that of course increases the cost that uh, uh, that that we need to bear um, but also puts a lot of strain in the system now uh, of course we cannot like stop returns uh, or uh, make the return window more stringent because that's uh, that will affect consumer experience so what we are trying to uh, then work on is again opportunities of uh, like low hanging fruit uh, and some of the things that we discussed in the past is about sizing and stuff but another thing that we can probably do is uh, somebody mentioned about rto all right for us rtos also are a large uh, uh, portion of the returns now once we follow like a more distributed uh, uh, or a network based uh, warehousing and supply chain model for us the we expect the rtos also to come down huh? once we are closer to the consumer uh, we can have like a next day kind of delivery i think uh, that segment uh, that portion of returns will uh, definitely come down plus all the goodness that will come in from the stuff that we are doing around sizing and uh, the rma based returns so these are the two uh, angles that we are trying to actually solve for in returns all right understood uh pavan on the returns piece anything else that you would add, want to add here what can we do to minimize returns especially for other categories i think in the interest of the time uh, and uh, i i'll i'll try to break this uh, returns into two uh, portions one is the customer journey and the seller journey in any case the customer needs to get the returns uh, uh, refund in the fastest possible time and therefore i think uh, systems and processes would need to be evolved to ensure that one is able to refund the customer on a successful pickup so i think that that's that's extremely important because the customer did not bother about the fact as to whether the product has uh, reached the seller and whether it was a qc positive or a qc negative so i think one important factor is the ability and the capability to be able to develop uh, uh, i mean to have the uh, to take the risk of refunding uh, refunding the customer basis a successful pickup but at the same time trying to evolve processes which would help mitigate the uh loss is also in this kind of a process because like since we are discussing footwear over here in case of footwear 42 to 43% of the returns are used products so therefore capability with regards to developing qc on a pickup will definitely play a very critical role uh, uh and and robust qc processes at the customer doorstep will will play a very important role because uh, as one of my colleague also said there are 50 to 60% of the demand is coming from tire to tire three towns and it is so spread and it is so wide that you just can't afford to have return consolidation centers so which typically most of the players have but that you could open up only in specific metros you have the scale and where you you could have standardized qc processes so therefore i think uh, that will become extremely important and last but not the least the working capital exposure which the seller is exposed to because if the return cycle is more than 30 days then i think uh, it's not a win win situation for the for the seller in the process 
so therefore i think logistics uh, systems and uh, and uh, uh, operations would have to be geared up in such a fashion at least in our context wherein wherein we run a many to many model we make it a point that we are able to deliver the uh, product back to the seller within 30 days i think i think that that will play a very critical role and more importantly giving visibility to the seller giving visibility to the seller with regards to the product and with regards to the different uh, stages of the order journey as well because today typically if you have to look at it that sort of visibility is missing uh, across the value chain i think and and, and i think expedited deliveries will play a critical role on the return side of it okay understood all right uh, thanks pan for that uh, i think we'll move on to the final question of the session now uh, there are 3 minutes left all right uh, my last question is to senthil so uh, senthil this is around the delivery models right so uh, aramex has experimented with things like delivery crowd sourcing in the middle east what alternative models do you see evolving in india uh, going ahead in the next 2 years it's interesting to see pancho i think uh, pavan also talked about it uh, about tech and collect model when he was talking about it so uh, what we have done so far and what we see uh, how the industry is evolving uh, is pancho uh, is uh, uh, the the e-commerce uh, deliveries have been exponentially increased in the last 2 to 3 years right and uh, catering to that through your captive logistics is not going to be scalable method to any any kind of uh, uh, logistics uh, arms so uh, having partners in the model becomes much more important for us so in that uh, angle we have experimented uh, many many of the uh, models uh, some of them has become successful like uh, like i think pavan talked about the kirana model right so kirana model is one of the successful model that we are seeing where we have participation with uh, kirana stores who can in turn Uh, not only act as a st- st- uh, pick up location but also can also do the last mile delivery to their uh, uh, minimized workforce which is catering to the small set of community that they can, they are they have confidence on right and we also see that the experience on this uh, mode has not been deteriorated um, it is in part to what we see in captive logistics method so that's one successful model that we are seeing secondly we also have uh, augmented uh, new delivery partners and uh, in the recent times you would have seen uh, yeah, uber participating with ecart in terms of delivering uh, during the uh, covid season situation uh, and we also have uh, other uh, uh, agencies uh, transport agencies uh, like uber and we are also having some uh, some uh, some experimentation on auto uh, while of delivering the product and that also seen uh, early success from our side uh, what we are not uh, uh, seen as a great success from the customer side is about pick up from hub or pick up from uh, store perspective right uh those, those uh, things we have not seen uh, very high traction from the customer yet uh just because that customer may not uh, one is uh, finding the location for the customer is, is tedious secondly to find out the window where he the customer has to step in has also become somewhat uh, 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 cumbersome for him thirdly uh, alternatively for customer anyway the doorstep delivery is happening at the doorstep uh, right so there was uh, much less concern for him. so the, these models have been successfully employed we also experimented with crowdsourcing crowdsourcing the major concern that we see is that um, uh the safety or the background verification process that we have in order to ensure a standard delivery uh, process to customer as the uh, as become a challenge in terms of managing a crowd source workforce uh, so what we have pivoted is slightly into a model called managed crowd source model uh, managed crowd source model may what we do is that uh, we have uh, some amount of commitment from the from the from the participants as well as uh, they have to pass through the background verification only then they will be uh, eligible for doing that we have seen that the model picking up uh, uh, faster and uh, that that seems to be one area where it will evolve uh, the other uh, areas uh, i think uh, it is done and dusted from many my many sites where you would have heard about drone deliveries or locker box deliveries and uh, so on and so forth right so those are more experimentative and uh, uh, exploratory at this point in time and the success is the success need to be seen in the future i guess okay all right uh thanks senthil for that mm, i think it's 4 o'clock and we are towards the end of our discussion i just want to thank once again all the panelists uh, jackson kalpak pavan and senthil thanks so much for joining in uh, thanks all the attendees for joining in taking your time out and listening to this conversation uh thanks everyone uh, i'll close this call now thanks, thanks, thanks for joining everyone thanks goodbye everyone Bye.